But um, as always, we're going to pray. But before we pray, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about my favorite subject. Does anybody know what my favorite subject is? Yes, yeah, three of you, that's right. Well, Jesus, that's right. God is my favorite subject. You know, um, anytime people ask you, what are you going to preach? Jesus. But tonight, more specifically, I'm going to talk about him, about his, who he is and what he's like and, uh, and something very specific tonight. The Apostle Paul prayed this for the Ephesians in Ephesians 1.17. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And so that's our prayer tonight. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this time we have together in the presence of the Lord. May you be glorified in everything that's said and done and sung here tonight, Father. And Father, I do. I pray, Lord, that you would give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. Lord, we want to know you more. Lord, we want to be close to you. Lord, we, we don't want to think vain thoughts, imagina- imagination Lord, about you, but we want to know you as you truly are. Help us, Father, and I pray that tonight, Lord, you would help me to say what is right about you and that only. And Father, that every person in this room tonight, Lord, would just have a renewed desire and passion to know you more and to be close to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, the Apostle Paul, after serving God for decades, He says, I want to know Christ. We ought to always have that desire to know him more. Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life. You ever want to know exactly what eternal life is? Jesus defines it for us in John 17 and 3. He says that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. When does eternal life start? It's not when you get to heaven. Eternal life starts when you know the Father and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. This is eternal life that they might know you and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. How wonderful it is to know him. You know, the Lord created man in his image as a living soul. And I want to tell you that a lot of people in our generation have done a very perverse thing where they want to reverse engineer God. They want to say that we're an exact replica. So if I'm this way, that's the way God is. That's hogwash. He created us in his image. We are not an exact replica. Do you know what's happening on the other side of the galaxy? No, you do not. Do you have the power to fling stars into space just with the words of your mouth? No, you do not. We are not an exact replica. There are ways that we are not like him at all. He's holy. The only thing that makes us holy is if he does it. But we're, we're born as sinners. That's what the Bible says. Amen. So I, I just want to make that point when we say, We're created in his image? Yes, we are. And what we're going to talk about tonight is one of the ways that we absolutely were created in his image. A living soul. He made us a living soul. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. And I want you to know, we have a mind, will, and emotions just like our God. He has a mind... He has a will. Amen. Amen. We want to do God's will, right? He has a will and he has emotions. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. We're going to talk about emotions because I want to tell you, he feels. And I think sometimes he gets this uh, kind of a a reputation uh, among a lot of people to some degree, or we'll just put it this way, to varying degrees that he is stoic somehow. You need to know that he is an emotional God, that he feels emotion. You know, one of my earthly heroes is Tom Landry. I I think Tom Landry was a great coach, but also a great mentor and a great Christian. And, but you know, one of the things that people say about Tom Landry that don't know him or don't know anything about him is they always say he was stoic. I showed Carmen a picture the other day of Tom Landry 
jumping up on the sidelines with both arms sticking out like this. And he's got about uh, two foot of uh, height. His feet are about two feet off the ground. I was, I'm like, well, yeah, he's real stoic, all right. <laughs> you know, he didn't always show it like some people do. But, you know, but he was not stoic. How much more should we not think of the Lord as unemotional or stoic when you see in the scripture over and over from Genesis to Revelation that he has emotion? And this, listen, we need to understand this and know this about our God. He feels emotion. You know, That may seem strange for us because many times, well, our emotions are a problem. But we mentioned this last week. His way is perfect. And his emotions are perfect. See, no matter how strong his emotions are, they're always right. You know, emotions can be a wonderful thing or a terrible thing, but one thing's for sure, they can be very powerful in our life and they can move us for good or bad. They can provoke us. But we all have emotions because this is one of the ways that we're created in the image of our Father. And maybe maybe some people don't feel things as strongly as others or maybe what's probably more likely the case is that some of us hide those emotions or control those emotions better than others. But We all have emotions, and so does our Heavenly Father. You know, I think emotions are a wonderful thing. Don't you? I mean, if we had no emotions, can you imagine what that would be like? Life would just be kind of drab and boring and empty in a way if we didn't feel. But, you know, I think that's... You know, that the feeling of love, you know, that's why people say it's better to have loved and lost than to not loved at all. Because, you know, we want to feel those things. Now, you know, we might say, well, I don't want to feel anger, but I think sometimes we must like it. It seems like it at least. But the issue and the problem for us is where we don't control our emotions, and we let them get the best of us. And I'm just going to say this plainly tonight. Now, the the focus here tonight is on him, but I'm going to address a little bit about us as well. And if you don't control your emotions, if you let your emotions run your life, they will ruin your life. Absolutely. If your emotions run your life, they will ruin your life. I mean, if you live by your feelings, you are always going to be, at best, you're going to be up and down spiritually because your emotions are so influenced by the world around you, by the circumstances, by what other people say and do. I mean, your emotions can be moved quickly by something that happens in your life. And if you're controlled by your emotions you're going to always be in a mess and be in trouble. Uncontrolled emotion. It can do so much harm and cause so many problems in our life. But with the help of the Holy Spirit, our helper, amen, he is our helper. That's what the scripture says. We can control our emotions. We can keep them under control. In fact, the Bible tells us in Galatians 5.23 uh, that that is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's temperance or self-control. So we can control our emotions, but get this now. Who, who, who empowers us or enables us to be able to do that? The Holy Spirit. And I just want you to know that's the third person of the Godhead, that's who we're talking about tonight is God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I'm just telling you, he has perfect self-control. So does he have emotions? Yes. He's not stoic, but he never loses control. He has perfect self-control. That uncontrolled emotion, oh, how much trouble 
it can bring. But his emotion is always right. See, what he feels is right in that situation. He's never rash. He doesn't lose his cool, fly off the handle. James 1.20 says, The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We've all seen the trouble the wrath of man brings, right? I mean, so many, I think, in our time, well, no, let me just back up. It was happening in the time that Jesus walked this earth too. So many, even who profess to be religious people, have this uh, justification sometimes for their anger. They are filled with righteous indignation. But let me tell you, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. The wrath of, how do I know that? We just read it. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And, but yet it seems like a lot of people try to justify their anger. The wrath of God will produce the righteousness of God. I mean, He's always righteous. He always does what is right. And we see many times in the scripture where you you see the wrath of God, right? They tell me people don't read the Bible anymore. So I just keep saying, read the Bible. You you can't really know God if, if you don't know the one true God. You need to read the Bible. But there's so many instances throughout the scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, Read the book of Revelation where you see the wrath of God. And let me tell you something about every one of those situations. It was right in that situation. Absolutely right. And it brings about the righteousness of God when he does it. His emotions, see, when they move him, it's right and good. Jesus, when he sees the people... Scattered like sheep without a, without a shepherd. You know, Jesus didn't say, you bunch of stinking dumb sheep. This is the way a lot of people act about people that are lost in life. Don't know what they're doing. Don't know how to handle their finances. Don't know how to raise their kids. Stupid sheep. Stupid people. Well, the Bible says Jesus was moved with compassion for them. He was moved with compassion for them. Listen, he had this strong emotion. He was moved. He was moved by it. Moved with compassion for them. You see, he was filled with emotion. And it was right. I just want to talk tonight about some of the emotions that you see in Scripture It tells us that the Lord feels since the very beginning, man has brought the Lord both pleasure and sorrow. In Hebrews 11, 5, it says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. That was Enoch's testimony. He pleased God. Enoch gave God pleasure. And the Lord just said, you know what? I'm not waiting for you to die. You're coming on up here with me. He never saw death. The Lord just took him on up. Why? Because he brought God such pleasure. He lived in a wicked time. And yet he walked with God and he pleased God. And the Lord just took him. But you know, it's not very long after that that we read about a different situation where the Lord was so grieved with man that he decided to do away with all of the wicked and just start over with Noah and Noah's family. It's Genesis 6, 5 and 6. It says, Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually and the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. That last verse in the NIV reads this way, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart 
was filled with pain. Have you ever just had your heart filled with pain? I know some, we might phrase it, your heart was just broken. He knows how that feels. He has felt that. His heart was filled with pain. I'm talking about the Almighty, the Holy One. He feels times when he gets angry. Hebrews 3, 7 through 10 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion in the day of trial on the wilderness where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation. He was angry because of their unbelief and their disobedience. Solomon. We talked about Solomon Sunday. What a great man of God, a leader of God's people, the wisest man that ever lived, the Bible tells us, and yet he did something so foolish. 1 Kings 11, 9 and 10, it says, So the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned from the Lord God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing that he should not go after other gods, but he did not keep what the Lord had commanded. You know, what happened was that Solomon, in his pride and arrogance, he married women who worshipped other gods and they turned his heart away from the Lord. But you see here that the Lord was angry with his disobedience. But you do know that the Lord not only gets angry with disobedience, sometimes he laughs at the wicked. Now these are two different things, right? He's not angry and laughing at the same time. He laughs at the wicked. And some people in this world, they want to judge God for all kinds of things. I want to tell you, if God laughs at the wicked, it's because it's right. So many people say, well, if I was God, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, we're, we're just all glad that you're not God. But there's a difference between the child of God who disobeys God. Yes, that makes him angry. But then there's also the wicked, the one who defies God, the one who shakes his fist at God. You see, he laughs at the wicked. Those that rebel against him, those that live out their life with no fear of the Lord, Listen to this from Psalm 37. It's, it's a little long, but that's okay. I'm going to help some of you get your Bible reading in today. <laughs> Beginning in verse 8, he says, cease from anger. <laughs> See, we're not supposed to be mad all the time, all right? Cease from anger, forsake wrath, do not fret, it only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes his teeth with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him. He sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart. Their bows shall be broken. See, the Lord laughs at the wicked because he knows that they're going to get what they deserve, the meanness, the, the horrible acts that they were going to commit against others. It's going to be turned back on them. And he laughs at the wicked. Moving on. He has joy. And he rejoices over people that serve him. 
In Deuteronomy 30 and 9, it says, The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. I just want you to understand that any time that we are obeying the Lord, it makes him happy. And part of that is, is that when we are serving the Lord and obeying the Lord, He can bless us. Now, I know we're not living under the law, but let me tell you, this has not changed. God will not bless disobedience. Nowhere in Scripture ever, ever, ever. And you can't just go, oh, but grace, it doesn't matter if I obey because of grace. Yes, it does matter. Paul says, because of grace, shall we just go on and sin? God forbid. Yet so many Christians today, they just think it doesn't matter if you just... Let me tell you, if you are walking in disobedience to God, it is at least in some measure keeping blessings from God on your, from coming on your life. And when we obey, when we walk in obedience and serve the Lord, it opens the door for God to bless us. Now... Get this, he really likes that. That gives him pleasure when he can bless his kids. I mean, every parent ought to understand what I'm talking about right now. In Psalm 35, 27, it says, Who has, talking about the Lord, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. The NIV, it reads this way, The Lord be exalted who delights in the well-being of of his servant. Now, when your kids do right, that makes you happy. You feel good, right? But when your kids are doing good, I'm talking about well being, when they're prospering, oh, we love that. I mean, when things go right for your kid, and you see that they're happy and, you know, that they're serving God and things are going well. Oh, that just fills your heart with pleasure and delight. And you see, that's what our Heavenly Father feels when we are serving Him and doing what we're supposed to be doing. He delights in us doing well and us prospering and blessing us. Every parent, I mean, you ought to understand that. Amen. Just think about this. Your heavenly father, he's the same way about you. He delights in you doing well. See, some people think that God, God must like it when he, you know, puts the heat on people and gets them. That's not the God I see in the Bible. You know, we talked about the wrath, but I want to tell you, he delights in people being blessed and doing well. Zephaniah, I am preached out of Zephaniah very often. 317, the Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. That's joy. I'm telling you, that, that verse just speaks of so much joy that he's singing over us. I wonder what that sounds like. I don't know. I want to hear that. You know, when you say, when you talk about joy, what brings you joy? We could get 10,000 answers what might bring us joy. But I know the one thing that gives him the most joy it's Luke 15, 10. There is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Amen. One lost soul that turns to the Lord brings him such joy. And you see, we get to be a part of that when God uses us in some way, when we get to be a part in a life turning to God or bringing somebody back in to the fellowship with the Father. See, when we get to be a part of that, we are a part of bringing joy to our Father. 
Jesus came and he showed us the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And Jesus showed many different emotions. And when Jesus talked with the rich young ruler, this young ruler asked him about eternal life. How can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him the commands. And he says, all these I've kept since my youth up. And there's an interesting statement. It says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now, you could just say, well, Jesus loves everybody. Well, why, why does it need to say this? There had to have been something that the disciples could see. Maybe it was the look on his face. Somehow, this is what's recorded in the scripture in Mark 10, 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Here is this man who's asking about eternal life. He's a pretty good guy. He says, you know, Jesus talks to him about the commands and he says, all these I've kept since my youth. And Jesus loved him. But Jesus already knew what was in his heart. But he loved him. Jesus tells him to go and sell what he has and give to the poor and then come and follow him. And the young man went away sad because he had great wealth. And the implication there is that he was not willing to part with his possessions in order to follow Jesus. But Jesus loved him. He didn't get angry at him. The scripture doesn't say it as some people like to act like it, but I think Jesus was angry when he cleansed the temple. It's John, one of those is John 2, 13 through 17. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And just want to point out to you, this is how all of these people, there's a whole bunch of people, it was crowded. And this is how all of these people made their living. When he had made a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. This is how these men made their living. And Jesus, this one man... He overturned their tables, drove them and their livestock out. But I want to point out to you in verse 15, he made a whip of cords. You see, Jesus didn't walk in and just lose it. That didn't happen. And do not use this passage as a justification for you losing your temper. That is a sin. And it's even a worse sin for you to accuse the Lord Jesus of acting like you. What he did was calculated and planned. He made a whip. And when he had made a whip, then he drove them out. And what he did was just and righteous. He was defending the Father's house. And I want to tell you, We need a little of that in our day. Don't anybody show up with a whip next week. But I'm just telling you, it wouldn't hurt for us to have some regard and respect for the Father's house. And if you want to talk about, oh, well, he doesn't live in a building. He never lived in a building. But it was where people came to worship. And they were dealing with all of this junk. And I'll tell you, it's not much different in our day and time. A lot of churches, it's all about the junk. So much junk going on. It's all about the people and not about God. And what happens is people don't really get ministered to. They might be entertained, but there's a difference. 
But we got to be careful that we don't allow the wrath of man to take over. But what Jesus did was the wrath of God. We got the greater one living inside of us. And if we let him, he'll help us do what's right. Even when we're angry, we can be angry and sin not. There were times when Jesus felt great sorrow. He wept because of the unbelief of the people at the tomb of Lazarus. And I think he wept also just because he wept with those who weep. But I want you to hear what it actually says in this passage in John chapter 11. We're going to read 11 through 15 just to start here. It says, Jesus says to the disciples, he says, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him. The disciples are, you know, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. I want everybody to see the next thing that Jesus says. Lazarus is dead and I'm glad. Do not be deceived about what's going on here. Jesus was not sad that Lazarus died. He says, I'm glad for your sakes. Why? I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there that you may believe. And you need to remember this is so important in this passage that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Let's go on. Verse, let's drop down though to verse 32 for time's sake. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. I just want to point out to you that Jesus groaned in his spirit and was troubled when he saw all of this weeping. Then it says, Jesus wept. Now I want to say to you very clearly that when you hurt and you're going through a hard time, yes, the Lord cares. But you need to understand that he wasn't weeping because Lazarus was dead. We just read it. He said, I'm glad for your sakes. He was talking about it like it was no big deal. You know why? Because he knew absolutely what was going to happen. That's why he said, I'm glad for your sakes that you might believe. He knew he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And when he actually does it, he says to the Father, I thank thee, Father, that you have already heard me. He knew that Lazarus was going to rise. He's not weeping because Lazarus is dead. The Jews said, see how he loved him. And some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, take the stone away. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe... If you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from that place the dead man was laying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe you sent me. And then he calls him out of the grave. He knew. He knew. Then Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem. It's recorded in Luke 19.41. As he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. In another gospel, he talks about how he longed to gather them to himself like a hen gathers her chicks. He 
wept over that city because he loved them so much. And he knows what all is about to transpire. He's already prophesied it. He told them not one stone will be left upon another. He wept over it. He was grieved and angered by religious people with hard hearts. Grieved and angered. Mark 3, 1 through 5, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. So they watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had a withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. It grieves the Lord when people are judgmental. It grieves the Lord when they are unbelieving. Now think about this. He was grieved and angered. And then what did he do? He healed a man. He wasn't controlled by his grief or his anger. He felt those things. But what a perfect example for us as one that no matter, you see, how we might feel, we obey the Father. We do what's right. And sometimes in the midst of a situation where you want to be angry or you feel grieved, Maybe God wants to do something amazing. Maybe God wants to do a miracle. But if we get caught up and we allow our our anger, our grief to control us, we miss it. You know, how we live brings either joy or pleasure or sorrow or displeasure to the Lord and if you have children you've experienced both from your children how you live will either bring the Lord pleasure or displeasure it'll bring him joy or sorrow and we've all done both but we ought to think about this not just well God will forgive me I don't want to cause him any sorrow. I don't want to bring him any displeasure. My sweet wife, you know, she doesn't she doesn't really know what most of us are talking about when we talk about how Jesus saved us from our sins, you know. When she was a teenager and learned to drive, she tried to be super careful because she didn't want to disappoint her dad and get a ticket. That was just like a terrible thing. I can't disappoint my dad and get a ticket. I know y'all are thinking, wish that was the worst thing I ever did, right? I'm right there with you. But see, we ought to have that attitude in our heart about our father. I don't want to do anything that would displease my father or hurt him or grieve him in any way. I just want to bring him joy. In Ephesians 4, 30 through 32, it it talks about some things that grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. I don't want him to feel that. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And we're living in this day where there's so much anger everywhere. I've got this thing now called road rage, you know. People just lose it completely and do crazy things. But it's not even just the world. So many Christians get caught up in all of this anger. And he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. 
Now, I want to tell you tonight that I really believe that the Lord prefers joy. I really believe that that is, you know, if you will, his default, that he likes joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen. And joy is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Being sad is not, okay? And he may have sorrow or grief over a child of God when they go the wrong way. But you know, the Lord doesn't focus on that. He's never depressed. I don't want the Lord to be sad or mad, but glad. Amen. Amen. Psalm 1611, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. I'm so glad. In Revelations 20 and 4, it says, And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Amen. You see, there's coming a day in heaven when all of that heartache and sorrow will have passed away. How wonderful that day will be. I just want you to know He knows how you feel. He knows because He knows everything. Past, present, and future. He knows every thought, every intent of your heart, and He knows how you feel. The Lord Jesus came to be our high priest. And he went through, in some way, all the things that we go through. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says, We do not have a high priest who who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. You see, he experienced every emotion and everything that we go through in some way. Have you ever loved someone and they didn't love you back? He has. Have you ever been wronged and treated horribly and hurt horribly when you didn't do anything to that person? He knows exactly how you feel. Have you ever been rejected? Have you ever been left all alone? He has. There in the garden, even the three that were the closest to him, they just fell asleep. Could you not tarry with me one hour? I used to it wasn't very long I got an answer pretty quick but at one point many many years ago I thought but Lord you don't know the guilt and the shame that I feel how could you know one who's so righteous and perfect and holy I guess the Holy Spirit reminded me quickly as I immediately thought. But he took all of mine and all of yours and all of the whole world's guilt and shame upon himself. He felt it all. I just want you to know that the God that we serve, he loves you. And he feels you need to know that about him. Stand with me. We're going to pray.